I am a huge fan of the University of Mary Hardin Baylor. Uh, I'm on, blessed to be on the board of trustees there. I love UMHB football. By the way, all of you TSIPs need to know that the most successful football program in the entire state is not at the university, it's not at Texas A&M, it's at University of Mary Hardin Baylor. I bleed Crusader purple. I attend every home game, and I make as many out-of-town games as I can. I've traveled with the team to Wisconsin and Ohio and Oregon and, and many cities in Texas, even Abilene. And I am no fair weather fan. Now, I know that, you know, that's a beautiful day, and I'm there with a couple of my buddies uh, to see a game. But I have been in the stands when it was raining sideways. Uh, and I've been in the stands when it was freezing cold. Let me see slide two. <laughs> You've noticed I've got fewer friends with me when it's freezing cold. And I was at a game a couple of years ago when it was 19 degrees at game time. <laughs> and I was the only fan in that part of the stands. Now, you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with Exodus chapter 3? Oh, it does. Turn, if you will, to the third chapter of Exodus. Things have moved pretty quickly uh, in the last couple of weeks, so let me remind you of, of Moses' story, uh, and I'm not going to recount the entire thing, but if you'll recall, uh, Moses bit, was raised in the, in the household of Pharaoh, uh, even though uh, he was trained when he was a young boy by his own mother who was able to, to raise him, but the daughter of Pharaoh actually brought him to live in the, in the palace. Uh, and when he was 40 years old, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave, and he killed him to try to stop it. Uh, because of that, he had to flee the country. And remember, he went to the, the country of Midian, uh, several hundred miles away, out in the desert, where he became, of all things, from the, from the household of Pharaoh to Midian, he became a shepherd. All right, so he was out tending his sheep when we open in chapter 3. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, which is also Mount Sinai, by the way, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. I don't know if you just read this and say, well, okay, it happened, or if, like me, you get all hung up there and say, my goodness. Uh, for one thing, I've tended sheep. They're stupid. They're just incredibly, what a pain they are. And so to even be tending sheep could be just monotonous and tedious until it gets crazy. And, and you're out in the desert tending the sheep, and you see something that you've never seen before and are never going to see again in your entire life. Right there in the middle of the desert, just to see a bush burning would be unique enough. But stop and think, it was not being consumed. Let me tell you, if there's a bush in the desert and it happens to catch on fire, it'll last about like that. But he watched this thing and it burned and it burned and it burned. But it wasn't consumed. And so in the understatement of the entire chapter, he said, well, I think I'll go look at that. I'm sure he approached with fear and trembling and kind of crept up on this bush. But I want you to stop and think about something else, too. We're Moses is the author of this, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And in the past two chapters, he gave a brief, I mean brief, summary of his life. What it doesn't tell us is about his relationship, if any, with God. Now, we know that since his nursemaid was his mother, uh, was, was Jochebed, uh, who brought him up in the Hebrew faith, undoubtedly he was a believer in Yahweh God, but we have no indication that he has ever experienced God, dealt with God, worshipped God uh, to, in his life. We know that being raised in the household of Pharaoh, he was familiar with the Egyptian gods. But he's seeing something here he's never seen before. He says, I'm going to look and see why it doesn't burn up. 
When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moshe, Moshe. Let me tell you, if seeing a burning bush that isn't consumed doesn't rattle your tree, when a voice comes from the bush and calls you by name, you know, it's one thing to hear, hey, you, you know, you can always look around, but when he says, Moshe, so he hears a voice coming from a burning bush, and he says something, I think, that's probably what we would all say, here I am. (laughs) Do not come any closer. God said, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Now, here's what's interesting, is that Moses' forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would have recognized God's voice and God's presence, because we know that he appeared to all of them, and they understood whom it was. Moshe didn't know who this voice was, so God's going to affect an introduction. I am the God of your father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. He had undoubtedly heard about this God uh, from his mother. Uh, he, he undoubtedly knew that the Hebrews were his people because, remember, he killed an Egyptian who was abusing a Hebrew. And now this God that he's only heard of in tales of his forefathers, all of a sudden, introduces himself coming in in the miracle of a burning bush. So Moses hid his face. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of the people in in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Lots of ites in there. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. I want you to stop and think about the context of this. He he fled Egypt. Egypt in fear of his life almost 40 years before this happened. He's 80 years old by now, I want you to know. So it's been 40 years. He's probably forgotten all about what happened back in Egypt. You think he's interested in going back to Egypt? I think there's no statute of limitations on murdering an Egyptian. Uh, and perhaps it's not the same Pharaoh who was uh, seated in, on the throne as, as was there now. But nonetheless, he's a wanted man. There's a, there's a price on his head. They're out to get him. And so God says an amazing thing. He says, okay, I remember that your people are still in bondage. And I want you to go back and liberate them. Now stop and think. The time, he's already tried that once. Remember, he saw an, he saw a, a, an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave and he killed him. How did that work out? Not very well. He got found out immediately and had to flee for his life. So he could have said, oh, God, hey, I've tried that. I'm not going to try this anymore. And God asked him an amazing thing. Excuse me, told him an amazing thing. Go now. I'm sending you to Pharaoh. Where's the last place in the world that he wants to go? Pharaoh, to bring my people out of Egypt. Moses said to God, Let me stop right here. This is the focal point of the lesson today, so I really want you to put your ears on here. Um, Has anybody here ever felt a call on their life from God? You don't have to wave at me, but yeah, I know I know a number of you that have, and you're not raising your hand. Let me tell you, when it happens, how do you respond? I responded just like he did. <laughs> I've, I've got a little saying around the office in here that the ladies in the office get really tickled about, but on those days when, when the ministry just seems like more than I'm really equipped to do, in my office I'll say, why me, Lord? And they'll start laughing out there because I sing the old Chris, Christopher song, what have I ever done? <laughs> and Moses did the same thing. 
he looked around and says, wait, you're God. You want someone to go toe-to-toe, nose-to-nose, mano-a-mano with the most powerful monarch in the universe, and I am a shepherd on the backside of the wilderness. So look what he says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now, i got to tell you, when the first time God said, I want you to go to the ministry, that's just what I said. Who am I? I'm in no ways equipped to do this. Still not equipped to do this. But he said, I want you to go. So, God, uh, once again, in the, in the Old Testament, there's a, a, a euphemism uh, that I just love. It says, God's nose is very long. God is very long of nose, which means he's very patient. Uh, at this point, I think he probably would have just slapped Moses on the back of the head and said, listen to me. But he didn't. He said, look, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. And he said, look, here, this will be a sign for you. When you go to Pharaoh, he's going to let you go. Uh, and when your people come to the land that I've promised them, the land flowing with milk and honey, you're going to worship me on this mountain. That'll be a sign for you. That's a promise, the same kind of promise he gave to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He told them, your, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. And here, he's doing the same thing to Moses. He says, I'm going to be with you. Listen, if God asks you to do something and you're arguing with him, what more uh, comfort does he need to give you other than, I'll be with you? Listen, what else did you want? Is there anything you can do to sweeten that? I mean, the God who spoke the universe into existence said, I'll be with you. That ought to be it. Do you think that was enough for Moses? I'm sure at this point he says, hey, I'm good. I'm in. And he said, well, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what's his name? What should I tell them? Now, did that seem just like an absurd question to you? It's not really. It's not really. Because particularly for the Hebrews, they didn't know God's name. They referred to him by a name, but to know a name was to know the person. And so the idea of a personal God is, a, is thoroughly ingrained in you as a Southern Baptist. It's not ingrained in the rest of the world and most of the religions of the world. You ask a Muslim if they know a, a personal God or Buddhist or, or Hindus. They don't know a personal God. We do and we take it for granted. To know God's name was to reveal a side of himself that no man to Moses' knowledge, had ever known before. So it's not that he's just curious and wants to know his name. He fully believes that God's not going to tell him his name. And God's going to say, well, you know what, I'm not going to tell you. And Moses says, okay, then I won't go. God, you know, exhibiting his patience once again, said, I am who I am. Now, that's kind of interesting. Um, In other words, what he's saying is the name is I am, and that's all you need to know. There was a name, there was a Hebrew name, but he said, that's all you need to know is I am. This is what you were to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Now understand Moses, wheels are just turning, and he's thinking, okay, about half of the Hebrew, excuse me, half of the Egyptian economy is built on the backs of the Hebrews. They're the source of manpower, labor, uh, free work, building great cities for the Egyptians. So if this ragtag shepherd appears at the door of the, of the monarch and says, let him go, how absurd does that sound to you? Well, to compound it, he's got to go to the Hebrews also. And say, I know you don't know me. Perhaps you've heard about me. You know, I'm really a, an Israelite. I was raised in, in, the, in the household of Pharaoh. What do you think the Hebrews are going to think about him? Are you kidding me? We're going to walk out of here just because you said so? Well, and he said, well, I'll tell them God sent me. And then they're going to say, who is this God? Which God? God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord it was Yahweh, 
The God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. So now he's, he's not even talking about how to deal with Pharaoh now. He's talking about how to deal with the Israelites. And he's going to give him further instruction. Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now let me tell you, he's got a real sales job to do here because although they have been treated horribly in the land of, of Egypt, it's all they know. They've been there almost 400 years now. All they've got in the collective memory is stories about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They haven't intermarried. They're still faithful to Yahweh God, but this is all they know. Think about a Baptist church and someone coming in and saying, we need a major change here. At the very sound of that word, people fall and trembling. And so as badly as they've been treated there, it's all they know. And so they say, you're telling us we're going to walk out. Sure, fat chance they're going to let us do it. We're going to walk out, just traipse across the desert and go to a land we know nothing about just because you said to do it. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, This Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders I will perform among them. After that, he'll let you go. So God is anticipating the arguments, the excuses that Moses is going to have. He's going to have, well, first they're not going to listen to me. And then he says, okay, here's what you do. You go and tell them, I spoke to you and gave you my name. It's almost like getting the, the, the seal from the king. Okay? He said, okay, well, how am I going to deal with the Egyptians? He said, look, you get the, the elders and you go to Pharaoh. Now, he's going to not believe what you say, that I'm going to have to you know, let you go. But say, my God demands that you, let, that you let these people go, and God's going to back it up with wonders and miraculous signs such that Pharaoh will not be able to ignore them. And, of course, we know that's what happened eventually. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor... And any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. All right, that went from just unbelievable to crazy. Unbelievable to crazy. These are slave people, subjected to hard labor, treated like slaves, uh, and the economy's built on their backs. Pharaoh is not going to let them go. God says he is. You might believe that, but catch this. He says, when you go, they're going to give you a going away party and give you stuff. Give you a lot of stuff, stuff you don't have now. You, you're thinking about leaving your house and home and all your worldly goods. Let me tell you, they're going to do you one better. They're going to throw you a going away party and pack stuff for you. They're going to give you a pounding like you wouldn't believe. Anybody here remember what a pounding is? <laughs> I saw some people go, What? No, that's where you give, give people a pound of stuff as a gift to help them start a new life. And so they're not just going to give them grain and, and, uh, and draft animals and practical things. They're going to give them gold and silver and perfumes and spices and all kinds of stuff like that. So when you go, not only are they going to let you go, but they're going to let you go in, a, in a, just an unbelievable way. Now, believe it or not, I'm going to stop here. We're not going to go into chapter 4 because I would have to really stretch out to make it. And I got a point that God just smacked me in the head with today. So I want to share that point with you today. There are many, many reasons why uh, that I could find to miss a Mary Harden-Baylor football game. 
How about some of these? The weather's bad and I don't want to get out. Apparently my friends use that. I have to drive 45 minutes to get there. They always want money. Tickets, refreshments, programs. I don't always agree with the coach's play calling. And you know what? The band sometimes plays music I don't like. Some of the people around me in the stands don't say hello to me. The seats aren't very comfortable. Sometimes the game goes into overtime and I'm late getting home. The coach has never once come to visit me. Despite all these possible excuses, I always find a way to go to the Crusader football games. Why? Because I love Crusader football, and I make it a priority. Did any of those excuses sound familiar? Let me just ask you straight up. Would we be more diligent about doing the things of God if we loved Him and made Him a priority? When God calls us to service, are we more like Moses? Why me? Or Isaiah? Here, my Lord, send me. God asked me that question when I put this lesson today, and it stung. It stung. Um, in 2012, 2012, I missed a Crusader football game because I was doing a funeral here. You know, I wasn't much I could do about when funerals come up, you know. Um, and so I make it a priority. I'm, you know, I love going to those, those games. I love the university. I think the university stands for what I stand for. I like to support it, and I'm going to go. I'm not going to be hindered. And yet there are times when God asks me to do some things that I say, well, why me? Can't you find somebody else to do it? By the way, what's your name? How can I be sure it's really God? Here's what I didn't want this lesson to come off as today. Um, I had a really good discussion just today with a, a dear friend. Um, who's not capable of doing all the things that he was used to be capable of doing. And the, the people who really have a heart for God, that bothers them. They feel guilty. Because I can't do the things that I once used to be able to do. Um, people who make excuses just make excuses. And so I'm not shaking my finger at, at you if you're doing what you can do. God, you know, you realize, don't you, that God's not going to call you to do something that He's not going to equip you to do. Uh, so if you can't drive at night, He's not going to get all over you because you don't come to the alive service when it happens at dark. You with me? I mean, you picking up what I'm putting down here? So, so don't think that I'm just shaking my finger, saying, well, I'm getting after you because either you don't, you don't tithe or you don't come to the live service or you don't come to Wednesday night or all the things you think pastors harp on you about just because you have a guilty conscience, by the way. But here's what I am saying is that I know that God calls us in many various ways. It's not always to do something monumental like deliver the Hebrew children from the bondage of Egypt. But sometimes it's like him calling me and saying, I would like you to teach 18-month-olds. Which to me is more terrifying than delivering the children from bondage. <laughs> However, I have found at that age you can put them in little Velcro vests and just stick them on the wall, you know. <laughs> they do okay there too. And, and so I argued have you ever stopped to think how silly it is to argue with God? Because sometimes 
you can win the argument. Believe it or not, you can win temporarily an argument with God by going, la, 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 just covering your ears and saying, I don't want to hear it. But is God missing a blessing because you're not working for him? Nah. It's going to get done. Who's missing the blessing? You are. Uh, I, I look sometimes at 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon is just the most prime nap time in the world. <laughs> I'm just here to tell you. <laughs> I'm just here to tell you. But, you know, I've got a friend who drives a long way at that time to teach children in another town. Because that's what God called to do. Uh, I look out at, at friends out here that I know dedicate parts of their lives to doing things that I'm, I'm in awe of you. I, I, Wednesday night, you're here to, to, to help children. Uh, you serve as a chaplain uh, at a hospital. Uh, all of this without remuneration. But every one of us still has that time when, when God says, you know what, I think you ought to do that. And, and you say, me? And we start making excuses. By the way, read chapter 4. He's not nearly done with the excuses yet. He's not nearly done. I did a, a series not long back on uh, Wednesday nights about Jonah. Uh, and if, I'm not going to recount the story here, but if you'll recall, God asked him to do something very specific. No, he told him. He said, I want you to go east, northeast, and I want, to, I want you to preach to a race of people that you hate and would probably love to kill you. And so Jonah didn't, didn't argue. He just went and caught a, a, a boat west. Didn't argue. Just ran. Just ran. I've done that too, by the way. Have you ever thought about the ridiculous idea of running from God? Joe Lewis once said of Max Schmeling, he can run, but he can't hide. And that's us before a mighty God. So here's what I would ask you to pray for. God's going to ask us to do many little things that seem so small but have huge kingdom consequences. Um, the ability to touch a child in the next two weeks uh, and help to lead them toward Christ, to teach them, to serve them, uh, just to walk around with them all day. Uh, the ability to pray for someone who is teaching a child. If you can't physically get up here, let me tell you one of the, you, you know my favorite part of Camp Crestview is? Here's my favorite part of Camp Crestview, the bag ladies. The bag ladies. It's my favorite part of Camp Crestview. I get teary-eyed thinking about them because these are people who, because of generally for physical limitations, can't spend all day chasing kids around or, or teaching them, but they're so determined that they're going to do something that they come up and do one of the most vital jobs, and that's putting out the literally hundreds of bags of snacks that we have to get from those kids. So they sit together at a table, share a devotional, and love on those kids by bagging snacks for them because that's what they can do. So which job's greater, preaching before a mega coliseum of thousands of people and sharing the gospel or bagging snacks for kids? You might be surprised. Read chapter 4 next week and we'll get another dose of excuses. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. And I'm sorry, Father, for the excuses that I've offered you when you call to give me an opportunity to be blessed in service to you. Father, I pray for each and every person here that, that when their call comes, Father, that they would respond quickly and resolutely uh, to work with you. Father, I know that you don't need our help, but we thank you that you allow us to. And as we go our separate ways today, Please bless us and give us opportunities to share. And Father, your blessings, your blessings upon Camp Crestview during these next two weeks. For we ask it in the name of your Son. Amen. Please find someone you don't know and say hello to them.